let me quickly recap what we did in the last three classes. For elements that have a non-zero nuclear spin, they have states in integer steps, 2i, num 2i plus 1 number of states, and they are all degenerate in the absence of a magnetic field. Once you suspend this in an external static magnetic field, B0, all these states start to have different energies, which we saw as the energy would be minus gamma H cross B0 times M, where M is the quantum number of that given state that you're looking for, correct? And then we also looked at what will be the orientation of each of the spin state. We looked at the example of I equal to half, and we realized that the theta between the alpha state and the B0 will be 54.7 degrees. Okay. Then from there on, after having understood the orientation of the states, we also tried to understand what will be the energy of EM for each of the state and what will be the delta E associated for a spin half system, which turned out to be gamma H cross B0, which is also where we defined omega naught as gamma B0. In addition to this, we also tried to look at an ensemble of spins. Meaning that instead of having a given isolated spin state, either in alpha or in beta, what if you have a number of spins? You're going to have population weighted vectors along all the axes. Therefore, for the alpha state, it will result in a magnetization M alpha that points parallel to the B naught. And then we also saw the effective magnetization for beta will be M beta that is anti-parallel to B0. And therefore, since you have two magnetizations, one arising from the alpha state, one from the beta state, the net magnetization will be a vector sum of M, M alpha plus M beta. Since M beta is aligned opposite to that of M alpha, they will have a destructive inf interference to give you a net magnetization M0 that points parallel to B0. So, so far, what we have understood, I'm Repeating it because you have to understand and accept that there is going to be a bulk magnetization, M0, that is generated from the nuclear spins that are present in your sample that is parallel to the external static magnetic field. So whenever I write something in terms of M, it's magnetization. Whenever I write something in terms of B, it is magnetic field. Magnetization is generated from sample while your magnetic field is applied by you. So I'm going to use these terms as we go forward to understand how does the magnetization be detected. So let's get started with today's lecture. We said that we are applying a B naught along the z-axis and for a spin half system whose gyromagnetic ratio is greater than zero, you get a tiny bulk magnetization that is present. What is the next step? We want to measure M0. Before measuring M0, let's ask what is the magnitude of M0. The magnitude of M0 is going to be given by summation over all the states, gamma H cross M times PM, where PM is the population. So this is nothing but the vector sum of M alpha plus M beta, if you think about it. And length of M alpha, M beta, how did we determine? It's proportional to P alpha and P beta, correct? So therefore, the PM starts to come and the alpha takes care, the M takes care of the value of plus or minus half. So basically, the strength of the magnetization, the bulk magnetization that you generate is what we want to calculate. M naught is going to be given by summation over. So basically, this is going to be gamma H cross by 2 P half minus gamma H cross by 2 P minus half. P half plus minus half itself was given by EXP gamma H cross B naught by 2 KBT divided by summation over M equal to minus half to plus half EXP plus minus gamma H cross B naught by 2 KBT. And we realize that the denominator goes to 2I plus 1 and for I equal to half, this, this denominator is going to just go to the value 2. Assumptions that were made is that gamma H cross B naught M by KBT is much less than 1. Or you can also say gamma H cross B naught M is much less than KBT. 
all this translates to the fact that you're trying to say the amount of energy that's available at room temperature is much, much greater than the energy difference between the alpha and beta states, making them more or less equally populated. And then the next approximation that we ended up assuming here is the random phase approximation. When you ended up resolving every alpha or the beta state, you said that the component along the plus Z and C for alpha or beta respectively ended up adding but on the other hand, anything that's on the transverse XY plane ended up canceling with each other because of the uncertainty principle involved. Correct? With that being said, that's also what is called the random phase approximation. And the above one is called a high temperature approximation. And these two approximations yield us the fact that P plus minus half is going to be 1 plus MH gamma P naught by Q. I'll erase the M. And then I'll put a plus minus with a two here because we are only looking at spin half systems. It give you an idea. We are going to get plus minus half back up here. So let's do that. So M naught is going to be given by gamma H cross by two. What is P half? It's going to be one plus H bar gamma B naught by two KBT minus gamma H cross by two, one minus H cross gamma B naught by two KBT. The one will get cancelled because of the negative sign and the other part will get added up with each other, resulting in gamma H cross by 2, H cross gamma B naught by KBT. So the overall effect of this is going to be gamma square H cross square. The important aspect that one has to realize out of this is that the M naught that you ended up generating, the bulk magnetization, just doesn't go with gamma, but it goes with gamma square. So therefore, if you're imagining proton to be having a gamma of say 10, I'm talking about relative, huh? so it's not absolute units. And then gamma C is gonna be something like 2.5, you have to divide it by four, it's the relative again, I'm not talking absolute numbers. Gamma N is going to be close to one, if I remember right, therefore, the M naught for a H, uh, one H at similar temperature, similar magnetic field is going to be something like 100. M naught of 13 C is going to be something like 2.5, 6.25 units. And something like M naught of 15 N is going to remain one. So slowly you are able to read, just doesn't play in terms of the population difference. And that also ends up reflecting in a serious reduction in the amount of bulk magnetization that it generates. The next aspect that I want to make you guys understand is how do we get the signal? You have a B naught that's along Z and you have a bulk magnetization that's along Z again. By Faraday's law of magnetic induction, if you end up keeping a coil anywhere here or here or here or right next to it, you will never record a signal because you'll only record a signal when a magnetization cuts a coil. The motion, the force that a magnetization M experiences in presence of a magnetic field is given by its cross product, which is called change of torque. Okay, J is what I'm referring to as torque here. The rate of change of torque, J, is going to be given by M cross B. The first thing that you're able to understand here is that Will this magnetization experience any torque with respect to the B naught? Since it's a cross product, you're going to have mod M mod B sine theta N cap, which is where N cap is perpendicular to both M and B. But the sine theta, the theta between the M naught and B is zero degrees. Since sine theta is zero, unfortunately, this magnet bulk magnetization does not experience any torque with respect to the B naught. So therefore, if you keep a coil anywhere, since there is no change, you can literally keep it anywhere in space, you will not be able to measure it that easily. For all practical purposes of this course, you can assume that when you generate a bulk, bulk magnetization and you put a receiver coil, you will measure nothing. Okay? With that being the case, we told ourselves that all information content is in this bulk magnetization. How am I going to measure it? The answer lies in the fact that the cross product will help you evolve the magnetization. If you end up changing the theta anywhere away from zero or 180 degrees, you realize that the cross product is non-zero. So your purpose therefore should be somehow to move the magnetization away from the Z axis. 
me it plus z or minus z. If we end up successfully doing it, then the magnetization will evolve and we'll be able to get it. So generally, whenever I teach this course, I go to the theoretical underpinnings and then show a simulation. But this time, I think I want to do it the opposite way so that you guys enjoy looking at some animation before, or rather a simulation before we end up understanding the math because it will motivate you to understand why the math works in a certain way. So in this regard, I had up already uploaded the link called drcmr.dk slash block simulator. The simulations that we'll be trying to do is called a block simulation. So if you end up going to the web page, it's gonna give you a bunch of instructions first to teach how this will end up working and how you can make it work in your computer. At the moment you hit proceed, it already starts with a predetermined state. Don't worry about what you see on the screen right now. Let's take a moment and we let's click equilibrium on the bottom left here. When you set the simulation at equilibrium, what you're able to see is the bulk magnetization. So if you're able to see the feeble line that they are showing is the B naught that is applied. The thick cylinder in gray is the bulk magnetization, M, capital M vector that you're trying to look for. So these are the two vectors. You see no change, change happens. How do you know no change happens? The shadow at the bottom here indicates what is the transverse projection of this magnetization. Currently, it is right now at the origin zero. So nothing is being present. If we are able to tilt this magnetization anywhere little bit away from zero degrees, let us see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna click something like 30 degrees hard pulse. Don't worry what is hard about it. We'll learn if we are able to go to the hardware part, what is hard pulse and what's the soft pulse. But for all practical purposes, you can just go for the 30 degree hard pulse. What I want you to look at are how does this bulk magnetization change and what happens to the transverse magnetization? Do you see something in the transverse plane as well? Are we ready for it? So I'm going to click 30 degrees. The moment you start seeing it, what ends up happening? The magnetization gets tilted by 30 degrees. I'm not telling you how we achieved it, but for now, all it matters is that if you end up tilting it, the angle is non-zero anymore. The moment the angle is non-zero, the B naught and M, M naught, or M in this case, are not collinear, and therefore, it starts to exhibit a motion called precession. Precession is because of the fact that the magnetization ends up experiencing a torque due to the magnetic field that is applied and therefore starts to go across a motion determined by its cross product. The external static magnetic field is along Z. Let's assume that you tilted it and took it a little bit on the ZY plane. Okay, so M is along, let's say ZY, and M B naught is along Z and the cross product is gonna get it out and therefore it keeps on going around itself, uh, in this motion of precision. And of course, take a look at transverse magnetization in terms of the shadow here. What you are able to appreciate is that you have a non-zero component of the transverse signal and therefore now, if you end up keeping a coil in the transverse plane, XY plane, you will pick up current, correct? because a magnetization keeps cutting this coil. Therefore, magnetic induction results in current being generated in the coil. Therefore, you'll be able to measure this. This is how an NMR experiment works. Of course, I did not tell you the details of how did this perturbation come up, which we'll see the theoretical framework as we go forward. Okay, so let's do it again. Let's go back to equilibrium. The moment you click equilibrium, don't worry about the signal that comes on top right, which I'll try to explain it in a moment. That's how you extract information, but for, so the time being, we'll not worry about this. We'll come back to the what is the signal after we finish block simulations, okay? So let's do it again. You are at an equilibrium. I hit a 30 degree hard pulse. This time I want you to observe one more thing. The thing is when I click the 30 degree hard pulse, there will be a red arrow that will pull the entire bulk magnetization. It, of course, it is very fast because it's a hard pulse. Hard pulse is something where you apply the perturbation really fast. So far, so good. You created a bulk magnetization. Now, if you perturb it, you'll be able to measure it as the overall idea. So what are the other types of perturbation? The perturbation that gives you the maximum signal would be a 90 degree hard pulse. Okay, I'm going to hit it right now. Don't worry about what's X and Y for the time being, but I'll just hit it. But let's see what is the motion that starts to come up. You hit it and you're able to realize the entirety of the equilibrium magnetization has now been tilted to the transverse plane. And if you see the shadow, along the XY plane is much more longer than what you saw for the 30 degree pulse. 
it's obvious because if you end up doing a 90 degree flip angle, the entire magnetization comes. So therefore the shadow is higher. If you did a 30 degrees, you don't end up tilting entirety of it. You just tilt a portion of it. So the projection is smaller. So you're able to realize that the sensitivity of an NMR experiment also depends upon how much you tilt. And of course, then you'll say, okay, why can't we tilt 100 degrees? The thing is, whatever you tilt beyond this will have a lesser projection again. So the maximum projection is going to come 90 degrees. The moment you go a little lower, the projection is going to be less than whatever you get for a 90 degrees. Okay, so the motion that you're seeing right now is called precession. This is happening because you have a magnetization that is not collinear with this external static magnetic field. As you're able to see, this precession is a motion that is going to always exist, correct? Because V0 is always there. We never turn off the V0. That's why we call it a static magnetic field. The moment you flip the switch on the NMR magnet, it never gets turned off. It's a superconducting magnet and it'll always conduct a very similar magnetic field strength. So therefore, it's always going to be on. Any magnetization that comes away from Z is going to show this precession motion. If I want to understand this, how do I get this signal, it's too much information to keep this precession happening all the time. So let's ask whether can we tune out the precession motion. And to do that, you actually click something called a given frame. We are currently in the laboratory frame where precession is observable. The moment we, which is also called the stationary frame, the lab frame or the stationary frame. The moment you click B0, watch carefully what is going to happen. Do not worry about the signal on the top right. Only look at the gray cylinder and the shadow along the XY plane. The moment you do it, the lab itself starts moving and your magnetization vector remains static. Because the lab is rotating at the precession frequency that's decided by V0. The frame that we are seeing right now is called the rotating frame. When we go to the frame of V0, it's called the rotating frame. So this way, what has happened is that the precession that comes about due to V0, actually we tune it out. It is there, but I just don't want to see it. We are not trying to say that it doesn't exist. No, it exists, but we just don't see it anymore. Okay, let's repeat the same exercise, what we did at the stationary frame in the rotating frame. Let's say, let's say I go to equilibrium. Equilibrium magnetization is along Z. So it's along the narrow white line that you see. Now, let me repeat the application of the soft 30 degree pulse, or let's start with the hard 90 degree pulse and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to hit it. What happened? The magnetization just tilted. And you guys are able to see right now, what did the red uh, thing do, the perturbation do? It actually just pulls it down. Let me repeat it. Let me go to equilibrium. I'm going to hit 90 degree hard. Unlike the last time where you couldn't see what the red vector was doing, now you'll be able to see it very clearly. This is exactly why we go to the rotating frame. So I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to hit hard 90. Look at the red vector. So did you see what it did? It just went there, pulled it down, and stopped at the XY, XY plane because we applied a 90 degree pulse. In addition to the fact that this vector remains stationary after the perturbation, if you guys realize the motion of the magnetization is actually visible much more easier in the rotating frame. In order to exemplify this, let me turn off rotating frame, go back to stationary frame. Let's go back to equilibrium. What I want you to observe this time is see that unlike in the rotating frame where the magnetization nicely came, easy tilt that happened, watch the motion of this magnetization in the laboratory frame. So I hit it right now. Okay, it, it actually did not go this way. It actually went in a little weird way. Yet again, to exemplify this even more, to see this in slow motion, I'm going to end up applying a 90 degree, something called a soft pulse. Here, you'll be able to see whatever happened very fast, it's going to happen really slow. And you're going to see the motion that's going to come for the magnetization when you apply this perturbation in the stationary lab frame. 90 degrees soft. Let's do a 90 degrees soft. There you go. You see this 90 degrees. So what it did is that instead of taking it very fast, it took it very slow. But the motion was very simple to see in the rotating frame. All we are trying to do is to see, okay, I want to put up the magnetization from its equilibrium. Why do I want to put up? At equilibrium, I cannot measure anything. Therefore, I have to take it away from equilibrium. When I take it away from equilibrium, I still want to not see some of the motions which unnecessarily might confuse me. 
correct? Let's actually go back to equilibrium to exemplify this point further. Let me go to stationary frame. Now apply the 90 degree soft pulse. Remember, spectroscopy is a study of understanding how light interacts with matter. The matter is your magnetization. The light that you're applying the is the RF field, correct? Now, the only complication that comes up is that there are two fields. There's a B0 field, there's a B1 field. B1 field is what you apply, and B1, B0 field always exists. And B1 field is a switch that you apply and turn off when you want. So now we are convinced that if you end up applying a B1 field, you can actually perturb things away from equilibrium, and such a perturbation will allow you to measure it. So now a little bit of what this signal on the top right is about. For that, I'd like to go to the stationary frame. If you realize, if the magnetization now starts a process about B0, if I keep a coil, it's going to cut the coil. So now let's assume that I keep a coil. It has to be a static coil. I cannot keep the coil everywhere. There's a single coil that's going to be present, right? You can imagine it that way. And it's going to cut the current. And while it's cutting, when it's on top of it, you have maximum. And as it starts to go away, it's going to reduce in signal. And it's going to keep going back and forth. So this is the oscillatory signal that starts to come up. And that's what you see on the top right is, if, in theory, you can imagine this as the current that is induced as the magnetization cuts the coil. And the, the current is going to be maximum while it's collinear with the coil. And it's going to be the minimum when it's opposite to the coil. And it's going to be zero when it's perpendicular to it. So basically, it's a sinusoidal wave that is coming up. Uh, sir, when you apply a, another magnetic field, why won't the magnetization just align with the other magnetic field and then the uh, with the resultant magnetic field? And again, won't the torque become zero? That's exactly what we will be understanding next. Your question is, how can a B1 field that you apply kind of go over B0 and get the job done? The most interesting aspect of this, which we'll see more as we go, what is the magnitude of B0? We are talking about hundreds of megahertz. The one that will be applying is in tens of kilohertz. This is one of the most interesting aspects of NMR. This is why NMR is also a non-invasive technique. The B1 field that we apply will be on resonance with something called the B0, and therefore we will effectively uh, result in a change of magnetization. The B1 that you apply is applied only for a very short period. The B, B0 is there all the time. So that is also a very important aspect to remember in mind. It's not just weak, but it's also applied for a very short duration. So now let's go back to the block equations I had. So this is the same thing that you got from quantum or even classical mechanics. The moment you knew the equations of motion, you could predict how long something will take to happen, how far it will go in a given time, given a speed and an acceleration, and a uniform velocity, and an initial velocity, so on and so forth. Correct? So similarly, this is one of the integral equations that is going to help you explain how the magnetization changes as a function of time given an applied magnetic field. So that's going to be the holy grail for us to understand how NMR works. So this week, all we will dwell upon is going to be the physics of how the magnetization evolves as a function of time. So let me write the next equation that will make things more easier. So all I'm doing from here to here is multiplied by gamma. So this is an equation which helps you understand how will magnetization change as a function of time. If you are able to imagine and understand and accept the motion of precession, most of what you want to understand in NMR is done. And I think there's one more uh, link I had shared in the classroom, which also gives you some other perspective. It gives you some idea of how the magnetization changes when you apply. This is actually the motion I was trying to make you understand. So you had the initial magnetization with dotted blue line that is being present here that doesn't change at all. On the other hand, look at the peak vector that changes the function of time. When you apply a given pulse, depending upon the strength, what is going to happen? The magnetization is going to end up experiencing something like this and gets to the transverse plane. And you realize that the motion is quite complicated due to precession about B0. So this is in the rotating frame. You realize in the rotating frame, the pink vector just moves much more easier, which is easy to imagine. So we are not changing anything here. We are just subtracting out the precision that comes with respect to B0. And this we'll see in terms of equation. So take a look at some of this before you come for next class. So there you go. This is also showing the same thing. 
they are probably trying to show different aspects of it. Oh, wow, this is exactly what we discussed today. Okay, if you guys accept that there is a bulk magnetization, the bulk magnetization has to be perturbed. If it perturbs, how it behaves? I think today's lecture is successful. Thank you very much. <laughs>